Hi everyone. Happy Wednesday before the week of Thanksgiving. Um, happy to be here tonight with Abram Bailey. Before we get started, I'd like to thank Heather Esterly of Alternative Communication Services for providing CART this evening. Thanks so much, Heather. Really appreciate it. Um, Dr. Bailey is a, a leading expert on consumer technology in the audiology industry. And he's an advocate for patient-centered care. We've been hearing that term a lot lately, and it's really important. Um, and he's also an advocate of uh, best practices in audiological uh, care of patients. And I welcome Dr. Bailey. I'll let you go ahead and get started. Thank you, Nancy. Um, so <clears throat> some of you may have uh, been, been with us uh, when I did a very similar talk um, last year. I, I believe it was kind of around the same time, time of the year. Um, and I have uh, kind of repurposed that talk and added a couple of new slides in to talk about some of the things that are going on. Um, so I do apologize ahead of time for anybody that feels like we're kind of going over the same, same material, but hopefully there's some fresh questions uh, that I can bring up today and uh, some fresh points. So just feel free to obviously drop any questions into the, uh, the chat so we can get to those a little bit later. Uh, so I'll just get started. Uh, the name of the talk today is Educated Consumers Hear Better. And this is something that I'm always uh, kind of on my soapbox about is that, you know, uh, consumers really, uh, the more educated they are about seeking uh, care, uh, you know, the, the kind of more they can push the envelope uh, with their audiologist to kind of keep them moving in the right direction uh, as far as, you know, providing a better standard of care. Because that is something that we are uh, grappling with a little bit here in our profession is getting the, as I'll talk about, getting the standard of care up to a certain point across the board. Um, so a little bit about me. I'm a uh, Doctor of Audiology, uh, graduated uh, from uh, Vanderbilt in 2009 uh, and basically went off and uh, did some, some clinical work for a few years uh, in New Zealand. I met my wife over there and um, uh, we now have a, a really cute 16-month-old uh, uh, baby girl and uh, anyway, after Living in New Zealand for five years, me and my wife came back to Austin, and I started uh, Hearing Tracker, which uh, is is a website and a, and a company. And the uh, the website's the whole idea, the mission is to uh, uh, you know educate consumers, like just like kind of what my talk is about today, educate consumers so that they can make better choices uh, when it comes to finding an audio uh, audiological solution or a hearing solution for themselves. So. Uh, the outline of the presentation, uh, the problem with hearing care, uh, how to find a hearing provider, understanding hearing aid features, and find better care using hearing tracker, and then some discussion. Um, and I added in a couple of things uh, under the um, uh, hearing aid features area and the how to find a hearing provider area uh, from a good friend of mine, uh, Cynthia Compton Conley, so we'll talk about that today too. Uh, so this is something that, that uh, you'll probably be familiar with if you've ever looked at our website. Uh, I, I quote this all the time, Consumer Reports estimates that as many as two-thirds of hearing aids in the U.S. are misfit. And that is probably fairly realistic um, as, as someone who's worked in, in audiology. Um, when, when we see a, a patient come in, oftentimes we test their hearing aids and find that they aren't actually performing the way that they should be. Uh, for that person's hearing loss. Uh, a large percentage of audiologists still fail to provide essential services, and receiving essential services greatly improve the chances for success with hearing aids. Um, so, so basically, you know, audiologists aren't providing the services that they need to be providing in order to get that number better. So, you know, people are walking around with poorly fit hearing aids, and that, that doesn't have to be the way. Um, so, so the the goal is, you know, we've got to get consumers educated about these essential services so that they can demand those services, um, and so that they can select providers who who are providing those services. And I think by doing that, it kind of changes the supply and demand, and, and uh, you know, makes it a little bit uh, harder for audiologists to be competitive if they're not providing the services that they should be. 
Um, and then I've got a little quote down there from Sergey Kochkin. Uh, consumers can be satisfied with a hearing aid, but significantly more satisfied if all best practices are employed. And this is a, a new slide with a picture of Cindy. Um, so many audiologists and hearing instrument specialists, uh, specialists focus on hearing aids and forget about other hearing assistance technologies, uh, which I'll talk a little bit more uh, about. But hear other hearing assistance technologies are technologies beyond, beyond the hearing aids, so other, other technological solutions um, that kind of go beyond. And uh, there's a lot of examples. And not enough focus on the needs assessment and the provision of comprehensive solutions. And Cindy's quote is, it could be as simple as hearing aids equipped with telecoils. And what she's referring to is here, here is the solution. So the solution could be as simple as hearing aids equipped with telecoils. So you can, for example, access hearing loops in your community um, and some instructive counseling. Or it might be as intricate as hearing aids, telecoils, ALDs, and formal training and speech reading and other strategies. How simple or involved depends on your particular needs. So again, the bottom line being, you know, the audiologist really should be responsible for uh, fully establishing, you know, what your particular uh, needs are and, and kind of uh, creating a plan around those needs um, that's comprehensive. So how to find a hearing provider and know what to look for? Um, so again, uh, and we'll talk about this, what these pr essential services are that I'm uh, coining essential services. Um, and uh, looking for uh, audiologists that are producing successful patients and possibly considering their educational background. Um, so what are the essential services in audiology and how can I find them as a consumer? So I added this picture into the uh, presentation this time because I realized uh, last time I did this talk, I didn't probably mention the, the sound booth as something that's important because I, I honestly forget that, that there are still audiologists or, or hearing instrument specialists that are out there that don't uh, have these things set up. Um, and they come in lots of different shapes and sizes. You've got, uh, you know, you can have one that uh, feels like a little closet that you walk into. This one's actually a slightly larger closet that you can walk into with the window, so that's, that's a bonus. Um, then you've got uh, sometimes where they're built into the, uh, into the room and actually take up the entire width and height of the room. Um, and I've even been inside of ones where you, uh, the audiologist sits with the patient inside of the uh, booth. And I don't know that that's the best, but, uh, but it's, it's better than nothing. So if you're not getting sat into a, a soundproof or a sound uh, uh, resistant kind of booth, uh, when you're getting your hearing tested, you know, that's a red flag that maybe uh, the, the place that you're going to isn't really up to the uh, standard that it should be. Um, comprehensive case history, so, you know, when you walk in, they should be asking you about a lot of different things. They should be asking you about, you know, how long you've been using your, hear using your hearing aids if you're an existing user, the, you know, all about your, uh, you know, medical uh, history, both related to your ears and uh, general um, uh, personality factors. There's a lot of different things that they might ask ask you about on day one, and um, I don't <laughs> I don't know if Nancy told you this, but I, <laughs> I had I had uh, my my dates messed messed up, and I actually thought this talk was tomorrow, so I I uh, didn't have a chance to go through my great notes on comprehensive case history right before this talk, so I apologize. Um, but uh, I would uh, encourage you to look that up and see what a comprehensive uh, case history entails because there's a lot of information that really should be asked uh, when you walk into an audiologist's office. Uh, they should diagnose your hearing loss. So that means um, more than just a hearing screening. So the, the worst case scenario is that you walk in and they just um, do a, a you know, subtle sort of screening uh, just to see if you've got any hearing loss and then recommend some kind of solution from there. Uh, because if you're, if you're not diagnosing someone's hearing loss completely, um, you may be missing some medical conditions that they might have. So uh, with a complete uh, diagnostic hearing test, they're going to be doing the, uh, you know, the air conduction test, which is the, the earphones over, over your ears or in your ears. Uh, and then they're going to be doing the bone conduction test as well. They're going to be doing uh, speech testing, so repeating back words. Uh, one of the tests that I really like to see is if they're doing speech and noise testing, 
uh, where there's some some noise presented and words at the same time. That's not necessarily part of the uh, diagnostic exam. It's not like a requirement for it, but um, if that is a part of it, it's definitely uh, valuable because it can give um, both you and the audiologist some realistic expectations for how well you might do with um, with hearing aids and also you know whether other uh, technological solutions might be required in addition to hearing aids um, to really uh, help you to hear the best that you can in background noise. Um, measuring uh, loudness discomfort levels <clears throat> and that's especially uh, if they're going to be fitting hearing aids uh, so that they can uh, check the hearing aid output levels uh, against what levels are going to make you uncomfortable uh, to make sure that they're not providing too much uh, sound. And, and that's good too if you don't want to you know, present so much loudness that you're, there's a risk of, of damaging the ears as well. Um, otoscopic inspection and cerumen management, so those are all big words, but basically that's just you know, looking in the ear, knowing what to look for, uh, you know, cleaning the ear. Uh, not, not all audiologists offer uh, cerumen management, and, and cerumen just means earwax, but you know, if you can find an audiologist's office that uh, has that service available and an audiologist that's, you know, um, kind of trained on being able to work in your ear, it can be very, very helpful because, um, you know, I've seen clinics before where uh, the audiologist has to uh, book you for uh, an earwax cleaning appointment and you may delay things at various points in, in your journey. Um, you know, they may have to send you away on day one before they can test your hearing um, to make sure they have your ears cleaned out. And it can also become an issue down the road when you might have wax in your ears that's causing a problem with your, your hearing aids function or something like that. So, so that's something, you know, to be aware of. It may be beneficial, especially if you know that you do have uh, ear wax issues. Um, they, they should counsel the patient, counsel the family, counsel the caregiver on the results uh, and recommendations based on the assessment that's done that day. Um, and then create a strategy to help, uh, help you uh, with hearing aids or any other plan of action uh, going forward. And again, that plan of action may involve uh, hearing aids, it may involve other technological solutions, or it may be some combination of uh, hearing aids and other technology and or some extra, uh, you know, counseling, specialized counseling or lip reading, speech reading, that kind of thing. Uh, so next here on the essential services is the needs assessment. Um, so this is something that is super valuable because if, uh, if there's no documentation of, you know, all of this information at the beginning, uh, it's really hard to go back at the end to establish, you know, uh, what improvement did you have before and after the intervention. So, you know, if the intervention is hearing aids, um, well, we're going to want to know all of this information. We're going to know want to know before the hearing aids are put in your ears. You know, what are your hearing difficulties? Um, what are your hearing goals? What are what are your motivations for improvement? Um, how much handicap do you feel that you have? Um, what are your expectations? Um, and that way, when, when you've, after you've done the hearing aid fitting or after you've done the intervention, you can go back later, back to that documentation, and you can actually look at it, and you can do the same surveys again, and you can find out, you know, how much improvement was there really? Did these hearing aids really make a big difference? And that can also come into, you know, I don't normally recommend like comparing a bunch of models of hearing aids because uh, I personally think it's more about the services than it is about the hearing aid. But if, if for whatever reason you find yourself in that position of trialing a different type of hearing aid because there's some feature that might help you, um, it's great to have the, this kind of documentation to, to actually show, uh, well, I did improve more with that extra feature on that, that other hearing aid. Um, and the other thing they should be doing during the needs assessment is looking at things like your, your dexterity, you know, how well uh, you manipulate your hands or man manipulate small objects with your hands, that kind of thing. Um, how easy is it for you, you to move your hand up to your ear and um, possibly put hearing aid in? You know, what's your vision like? Are you able to see the, the small batteries and change the small batteries um, support system? So what, uh, you know, who do you have around you in your life? What infrastructure is there? Who family support there to, to kind of help you through this, this um, journey? Um, and uh, Cindy has sort of a unique uh, 
approach to assessing uh, your needs, and she calls it the receptive needs assessment, um, which is something that she kind of preaches, and I really like it, um, and I think it should be something that more audiologists uh, incorporate into their practice. I really couldn't tell you um, how, how popular this method is, but uh, it certainly is, is valuable. So uh, there's, you know, the, the different sort of receptive modes of communication are face-to-face, -face, so that's, you know, one-on-one -on -one, uh, situations in group conversation. Then you've got media, which is TV, radio, tablets, tablets, phones, <laughs> movie tips, telecommunications, landline, mobile phones, uh, teleconferences using phones and computer devices. So that's, uh, some of you may know this from your work that uh, the phones at work are different from the phones that you have at home. They are uh, voice over IP phones and uh, sometimes we need to be aware of that when we're uh, recommending solutions because some of the technology solutions, for example, do, do not work with uh, tr um, these VOIP phones, but they do work with landlines. So it's just it's an important part of the understanding for the audiologist. I think you know I've found myself in that situation as an audiologist where I didn't ask the right question about this, and then found out later that the patient was still struggling uh, on their work phone. And I found out, well, that's because they have a special kind of phone that's a VOIP phone at work. And I should have really asked them about that. So this is it's a good, it's a good criteria for an audiologist to follow. Um, and to whatever extent you can kind of incorporate this into your discussion with your audiologist, you know, um, it's going to probably help to guide their decision making and make things more efficient for you. Uh, the other one is alerting. Um, and that is things like uh, beeping or vibrating alarm clocks, like light coming out of them, or they vibrate smoke alarms um, that make a lot of light or vibrate baby cry um, alarms. Basically, all of these alerting things, they're either going to make light or they're going to shake, and they're, they're going to let you know in some way that is not auditory um, that, uh, that something's happening that you need to be aware of. Uh, and that's, you know, probably fewer people that are in that uh, camp that need to worry about the alerting, but they, you know, if there is somebody like that who does have severe to profound hearing loss, it's definitely something um, that you should ask your your audiologist about to you know, find out if there's if there's some things that might help you. And there's actually a couple of things that are coming out now on the smartphone, some smartphone apps that are solving some of these alerting problems um, for people uh, downloadables that you don't have to buy. To, so you can look that that, that kind of stuff up on your um, app stores and things like that. Um, OK, essential services for hearing aids. So uh, I kind of redid these slides a little bit to uh, break this up a little bit. So you've got um, you know, all these different styles of hearing aids. You guys are probably uh, you know, very educated um, consumers about hearing aids at this stage. But um, you know, when an audiologist is uh, trying to decide uh, which type of hearing aid to give you or to recommend to you, um, these are the kinds of considerations that kind of come into it. So, you know, what's your ear canal like? Is it, is it really, really narrow and bendy? Uh, and if so, um, obviously there's going to be some hearing aids that aren't going to work well. Uh, that one on the left there, um, you know, for example, it's going to be a certain width and it's very straight. So. You know, there may be some ears that that doesn't work for, um, and I'll, I'll, most of those really small ones. You know, if your ear canal is too small, um, it's just it's not feasible. So we need to be aware of that. Um, ease of insertion and manipulation, and that goes back to the uh, dexterity, manual dexterity that I just touched on a minute ago. Um, you know, some of these types of hearing aids are easier to get into your ears than others, and I mean, in, in all honesty. Uh, I've seen it go both ways. Some people find it easier to get the, um, you know, the little in the ears in, and some people find it easier to get the behind the ears on. Um, and really, uh, one thing that I would expect is that, you know, when you're in the clinic, that you could practice with your audiologist before um, deciding on a particular style. You know, I used to, uh, if someone told me they had a problem, you know, with uh, their dexterity, I would. I would have the, the the little dummy hearing aids, and we'd practice together. And I know many audiologists do do that kind of thing, so that's something you should expect. Um, com comfort and skin sensitivity. 
Uh, the hearing aids on the right there are going to be probably far more comfortable in your ear, um, although some people do like the snug feel of the other kind. Um, skin sensitivity is another issue. Um, some of the hearing aid models are hypoallergenic, uh, and some of the little domes that go on the tips of those uh, in the ear, uh, the ones on the right there, are, are hypoallergenic. And so, you know, it's just something to think about. Uh, cosmetic concern, obviously, you know, how concerned you are with how the hearing aids are going to look in your ear. You know, we should be asking all of these questions. Um, and occlusion just means how blocked up your ear is. So if your ear is uh, very blocked up, um, you know, that can cause your, your voice to boom in your ear. Um, that can cause uh, you to have some discomfort. It can be uh, frustrating when you're eating, things like that. So. Um, you know, but if you do have a lot of hearing loss, you know, unfortunately, you have to put up with some of that in order for us to deliver the uh, levels of sound that you need um, to actually get the sound, <laughs> the, the, the sound to be audible for you. Um, I uh, added a couple of pictures in here, so this is more hearing aid considerations. I'm sure Juliet Sturkins is going to be. Uh, over the moon that I've added a picture of a hearing loop. I don't know if this is her favorite graphic or not, but um, it shows these guys in a meeting over here and they've got the loop going around the room. Um, and the idea there being that, uh, you know, the telecoil is is something that the audiologist should be should be considering uh, when when they uh, when they're recommending a hearing aid model to you. I mean, I think it, it would be great if every hearing aid had a telecoil um, in it, uh, especially right now because there is no other, you know, open universal standard for, for wireless. Uh, so it's, it is an older technology, but it is the best technology uh, that we have right now, and it works. So, um, so to, if you can, uh, you know, encourage your audiologist to, to give you a telecoil in your hearing aid and to set it up for you, um, to make sure that you know how to use it, uh, then I think that can be beneficial, uh, especially if you find yourself in, in the meeting rooms or in, in uh, gathering spaces that are equipped with a telecoil loop. And the telecoil is also very useful for uh, using um, landlines. And I, I don't believe it so much with mobile phones, but um, and the other the other thing, of course, that's a big thing right now is um, you know smartphone connectivity. Uh, and I've got the little picture there of the uh, Starkey hearing aid with the TrueLink app. Um, you know, streaming audio from your phone and things like that can be really great. Uh, the, you know, the hands-free phone situation isn't really um, all there yet because, uh, to my knowledge, there's not really a hearing aid uh, out on the market right now that can pick up the sound from your voice um, while you're on the call. So. Uh, there's a couple of models out there where you have like a little clip-on microphone that you can wear on your shirt uh, while you're having a phone call. So it's kind of hands-free at that point, but it does require you to buy another accessory and have that with you. Um, or obviously taking the phone out and holding it while you're talking, you're still going to get the benefit of um, you know getting great sound that's amplified for your hearing loss through through your phone. Um, so there's obviously still a benefit there, but uh, but they haven't really, to my knowledge, they haven't really fixed the the hands-free, you know, 100% yet. Um, anyway, so there's those, those two pictures that I wanted to talk about. Then you've got, um, you know, other basic hearing aid considerations. You know, like volume. And, you know, obviously we need to think about how loud the hearing aid is. Is it loud enough for you? Frequency range. You know, if you've got uh, no hearing after 3,000 hertz, well, you don't really need a lot of frequency range, but you might need uh, frequency shifting, so that's uh, you know another one I added in there. So, you know, if the sound, if you're if you're missing all the high pitches and there's no way we can amplify those for you, well, then the next option is to bring those high pitches down into the audible area that you still do have some residual hearing. So, um, and I've heard very good things about Phonax new uh, sound recover two. Um, so, you know, for those that do have that precipitously sloping hearing uh, loss, like uh, we refer to it as, um, you might consider uh, looking into that new um, Phonak technology. Um, let's see what else. There's tinnitus programs, you know, that's uh, hearing aids that can produce a, a noise in your ears, like a, a masking noise or other kind of musical tones that help to relieve your tinnitus. 
Um, then there's things like uh, directional audio input or um, direct audio input. That's uh, where hearing aids can have a little boot that goes on the bottom that allows wireless sound from. And this is really popular with kids in classrooms where you have all this uh, gear in the classrooms to beam the sound directly to their hearing aids um, via these uh, FM systems. And then they sometimes need a direct audio input uh, boot, or sometimes you want to plug uh, an audio source straight into your hearing aids like an MP3 player. I think all that's going to change with the advent of the wireless technology, but right now it's uh, um, you know, sometimes still required to talk about FM and DAI and all that. Uh, obviously, the other things uh, that you should be talking about, um, that you should be asked about, rather, is uh, your budget. Um, yeah, uh, you should be told about the, the warranty period of the, the, the product. I mean, the, the audiologist should be considering those things when they're recommending hearing aid models to you. Um, and uh, you know, lastly, I wanted to mention rechargeability. That's kind of uh, it's a big topic right now. Um, Phonak and Signia both just released uh, lithium-ion rechargeable battery products that are supposed to last like 24 hours. Um, I think that the Signia product lasts a little bit longer if you're streaming all day long. Um, but obviously, that's just their claim, marketing claims. So that's something to look into. Um, and then there's a there's actually a retrofit uh, rechargeability product called a Z Power, which can be fitted onto existing hearing aids. Um, so uh, you know, if re if if you have trouble changing your batteries, or you just don't like going through you know millions of batteries, uh, that's something that you could consider. So anyway, getting back on track. You know, if you're going in for an appointment and you're, you know, considering purchasing hearing aids, these are all things that the audiologist should be talking about with you and considering for you um, when making their recommendations. Um, right. So, essential services, quality control. Um, this is probably one of the worst. Uh, you know, audiologists just, uh, you know, are so bad at this, and and mostly it's because they don't have the equipment uh, on hand. Because it, it, you know it does cost money to have this extra equipment, uh, which maybe might be considered, you know, um, unnecessary uh, for some. But basically, the idea is you put the hearing aid into the little test box, and the test box are very they're very sophisticated these days, and they can automate all these amazing tests. Um, you put your hearing aid into like a test mode, um, where it kind of goes back to the factory settings and. And then you put it inside the test box, and you know you can run through a bunch of tests. You can make sure the directional microphones are working. You can make sure the uh, the noise reduction is working. The, I think there's a feedback suppression test to make sure that you know the feedback systems are working. Um, you can make sure that the microphones and speakers are working just like they should be. Um, and there was a study a while came out a while back that said something about you know, one out of every three or one out of every four or something like that hearing aids came with their directional microphones backwards. And you know, who's, you know, that might be good for a taxi driver, but it's not going to help, you know, the average person in a conversation. So um, you definitely can benefit from finding an audiologist who has one of these boxes around. Um, and the other thing that's great is if you walk in there with a concern and say, hey, my hearing aids, you know, don't sound like they did uh, when I walked out of here the other day. Uh, something seems wrong. You know, it's so much easier if the audiologist can throw this uh, hearing aid into the test box and put it into test mode, make sure all the hardware is functioning, and kind of roll that out and say, okay, well, you know, rather than having to send your hearing aid back to a repair facility um, and maybe have to fit a loaner, or worse, leave you with no hearing aid while that's away, um, and also verifying repaired hearing aids. So, you know, if your hearing aid was sent away and repaired comes back to the audiologist's office. Well, guess what? Sometimes the hearing aid is not really as repaired as you want it to be. So, you know, normally they're fine, and normally the manufacturers do include a printout of the hearing aid meeting the specifications again. But it doesn't hurt to recheck. Uh, and so, you know, the, the hearing aids just come out of shipment, and anything can happen. So, you know, not to make you guys paranoid, but it's just a great service, and I think it would be nice if everybody did this. Um, and verifying uh, after evaluation. Um, 
I don't even really know why I wrote that now. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> so anyway, uh, the other thing that they should do is attach the electroacoustic measurements to a patient file. So this test box produces electroacoustic measurements, just measurements of the hearing aid. And it's really great if uh, the audiologist prints those and puts those in your file because, again, that goes back to checking the hearing aid is consistent. So, um, you know, if they if they have made modifications to the program settings or whatever, they can actually run the test then, have a, a printout of how it's supposed to be working under your program settings, and then they can run that again later um, to see if your hearing aid is still working the way it should. Okay, sorry, I didn't mean to spend a, as much time on that as I did. Uh, the other one that's a big one uh, that, you know, is it's just it's so important to have this test done um, is real ear measurement. Uh, that's a picture of my friend Doug when we were both uh, at school, and I think that's Elise or Jane anyway having her ears tested. But basically, what's happening there is if you look at the picture on the right, the uh, hearing aid is in the ear, and then there's a little tube that goes down into the ear. And what's happening is that the machine that Doug is touching, that machine has a speaker on it which plays out some sounds, and the sounds go through the hearing aid and then get amplified and then enter into the person's ear. So when we uh, put the little tube down in the ear, we're actually able to pick up the sound inside the person's ear and verify that the hearing aid is producing the volume levels that it's supposed to for your prescription. So um, if you don't have this test done, uh, you're basically, you know, kind of flying blind. I mean, the audiologist doesn't really know what the sound levels in your ear are. Um, you know, they might be taking an educated guess, uh, but it's, you know, they really don't know. Um, and you might say, oh, it's a bit too loud, and then they turn it down a little bit. But guess what? They still don't know where the sound is. They're kind of just guessing and making little changes and kind of hoping that they're going to get it right. Um, and I, I think really that uh, you deserve this uh, kind of service uh, if you're paying that kind of money. Um, and I keep telling uh, audiologists that, uh, you know, if they want to stay relevant, you know, as we kind of move into this, this uh, new era of uh, over-the-counter products and all these things that are coming off the Internet, um, then they have got to do this test because it's the only thing that makes us better uh, than, than the things that are on the market uh, that you can get without going to an audiologist. So, so this is a big one. Um, and I don't, I don't mind you telling your audiologist that if they're not doing it. You can blame, blame me. Um, so yeah, so you can uh, re remember I mentioned that loudness discomfort test uh, earlier. Um, they can, they can actually check that using this measurement, they can check that the hearing aids aren't producing sounds that are over your loudness discomfort levels. So when you walk out the door. Um, you're much more likely to find the hearing aid volume uh, comfortable for you and, you know, not have to return and say, hey, it's too loud. Uh, so that's a really great, great thing to do to kind of get it right uh, out the door. Um, and then they can verify features um, such as the telecoil and the directional microphones using this test as well. So uh, the directional microphones can be verified in the test box like we just talked about or you can verify uh, the directional microphones using this kind of a system. Um, and they can also do a, uh, a telecoil test. You know, you can have the patient hold the phone up to your ear or do different things while you're running the test. Um, right, so uh, if anybody has any questions about this, let me know. Happy to answer questions about our real ear measurements. I used to train audiologists on that stuff. Uh, so another essential services, uh, services component is the, uh, the orientation, uh, which is, you know, after you've had the uh, hearing aids fitted, uh, where the uh, audiologist kind of takes you through and explains everything. Um, and sometimes they have an audiologist assistant that does this. Uh, and that, that if they're a good audiologist assistant, that's, that's fine. Um, but basically someone's going to walk you through all of the features of your hearing aids, you know, wh how you should expect that uh, the hearing aids are going to change in different environments. Um, uh, you know wh why your hearing aids might get softer or louder depending on you know the noise level and situation and um, you know how the feedback uh, uh, system works and why you might hear feedback sometimes and what to do about it. There's a whole bunch of features that they might talk about. You know if you have a music program or a tinnitus program, they might talk about those. 
Um, obviously, uh, they want you to be able to put the hearing aids in your ear and take them out. Um, and that can be sometimes a challenge because we only have so much time booked for these appointments usually. Um, and then we've got someone else waiting in the waiting room. Uh, and most of the time that's fine, but you know, if it is, if you are someone who struggles with your dexterity, um, uh, sometimes you might have to come back to do more training on that. Um, so that's pretty normal. Um, battery use, how to change your batteries if you have rechargeable batteries, um, how to use the charger, uh, how to clean your hearing aids and care for them. Um, obviously, if your hearing aids get dirty, they can stop working. And so it's really great uh, to know how to fix and uh, you know do it yourself, I guess, for, for some of these for some of these problems so you don't have to kind of come back and forth to the clinic. Um, and again, some of this stuff they could go through with a support person. So, you know, if, if some of these things are difficult for you or for the patient, uh, you know, th there may be a loved one or a, f a family member that can, or a friend who can come along and, and kind of pick up on this information as well. And I do recommend that, I mean, even if you are capable of doing it all, just to kind of have a second person there uh, absorbing it that you can call with questions later or get help from later. Um, they will go over comfort with you, uh, you know, what to expect, you know, your ear may feel a bit blocked up, that kind of thing. Um, feedback, you know, um, another thing is uh, moisture, you know, your ear sometimes might, might sweat if you've got a um, more occluding type of hearing aid, so some topics around that. Um, how to use the telephone and going back to Cindy's talk, you know, um, uh, you've got, you might have three different types of phones that you're using or more. Um, and then they're going to talk to you about the warranty information, you know, how many years of warranty you have and what are the conditions of the warranty. Um, and then if you've also purchased any accessories with your hearing aids, um, the, they should be, uh, the audiologist should talk to you about you know, all of that stuff at that appointment. So going through and learning, you know, how to use your remote control and how to use your smartphone compatibility. And, um, and you may not learn everything on day one, but you know, they'll at least teach you the basics and give you the, uh, the little booklet with the instructions and, you know, ask you to have a look at that and, um, you know, maybe talk to you a little more about it on the next appointment. Okay, um, so the, the counseling and follow-up. So you know, setting a wearing schedule is always a good idea. Um, the more you wear the hearing aids, uh, you know, the better you're going to do. Um, some people, um, you know, need to keep track of what they're doing or plan how many hours they're going to wear them. Um, so, so sometimes it's good to have a little more structure that way. Um, and, and nowadays we can also look into your hearing aids and see oftentimes using data logging to see how many hours you've been using your hearing aids, um, you know, in what conditions you've been using your hearing aids, were they, you know, noisy environments or quiet environments. And, and that all provides great information back to the audiologist, especially if you're having any, uh, any issues. Um, adjusting to amplification, uh, you know, you should be counseled about that, but, you know, basically it takes time to uh, get used to the louder sound. And uh, one of the things that um, is, a, is a kind of audiologists go back and forth about this is, you know, do you start the patient on a, on a really soft level uh, on day one and kind of ramp them up over time, or do you just start them at a louder level where they're going to get really good benefit on day one and just counsel them um, on, on adjusting to it? And, you know, different audiologists take a different approach there. Ultimately, it's, it's not really a big deal which way you, they go as long as, to me, as long as the end result is that you're, you know, eventually getting up to that level of sound that you need where you can, you know, reach the benefit that you, you need to hear better and do better in all the situations that matter for you. Um, going over the goals and expectations again, um, you know, uh, what goals did you set in the beginning and did you meet them? Um, are your expectations being met? Um, talking about environmental issues, um, you know, again, talking about background noise and other, other kinds of issues, um, listening and com communication strategies. So, you know, uh, you know, make sure, that, you know, especially if the loved ones are there or your family and friends are there, you know, that's a, a great topic to bring up. Um, you know, while you have them there, you can say, um, listen, you know, this, you know, this person, uh, my patient has, has a significant hearing difficulty and 
um, I would appreciate you know if you would make sure to look at them and speak um, clearly and slowly. Um, you know if they're not understanding you, you know don't don't shout at them and you know don't lose patience with them. All that kind of stuff. So you, and and then some of that as well as the strategies for the listener. Um, in terms of you know um, commanding people's attention and uh, and and how to talk to people to um, who don't know the the strategies and get them to do uh, the things that they should be doing to make sure that they're communicating effectively, um, but also things like um, you know looking at uh, the mouth and being close to the other person and um, trying to minimize uh, you know the noise around you. Sort of where do you sit in the restaurant? Do you sit in the quiet area? That kind of stuff. Um, hearing assistance technology, uh, you know, that really should be, you know, potentially part of the entire journey between, you know, the time you kind of come in and have your hearing tested to the end. You know, I think it's a, it's a really great thing if the, like going back to, again, Cindy's receptive communication needs, if it's really great if the audiologist can, um, can go and identify all of those different areas that you might be having a problem, and if a hearing aid can meet, you know, all of your needs uh, throughout all of those situations in, in work and home and community, um, you know, with your phones and you know, with with one on one and group and all that stuff. If hearing aids can do all that, great. But you know, if if not, uh, hearing assistance technology should have been talked about, and um, and and here here in the counseling, they should be. T teaching how to use all that stuff and talking to you about you know the optimal optimal ways to get get the most adva advantage or benefits uh, from those products um, and the speech reading again I, uh, it's just uh, you know how to kind of you might have to go to a specific like speech reading class I don't know that many audiologists are are talking about that but um, you know it is it, it can be beneficial especially if you have a lot of hearing loss to uh, take a speech reading course. Um, Assessing outcomes, I may have already kind of touched on this uh, by accident, but um, so possibly I was confused there on that last slide. But basically, going through your, um, uh, going through and looking at those initial surveys that were done, um, and uh, completing the second half of them to, to show that there has been a, a, a documentable. Um, uh, benefit, or, or you've you've actually progressed and and uh, met your goals and that sort of thing. Okay, so um, how to find a hearing provider? Um, I know all of you guys are uh, already involved with HLAA, and so you're aware of the benefits of being part of the organization and um, you know hopefully attending the local meetings and talking to your local chapter members about. Um, you know who to who who to go and see in your community. Who's doing a good job? Um, what audiologists are you know are doing a good job with their patients? I know uh, there's a there's a group here in uh, Texas down the road in Sun City that I go to and do talks sometimes for, and that's uh, one of the things that's an interesting topic of, topic of conversation for them is you know trying to figure out where where the members should go uh, to get to get the help they need, um, and that. Kind of talk ties into talking with your friends. I know a lot of people are shy about their hearing loss, but um, but it's you know people are more likely to complain than they are to to uh, to boast about the care that they're getting. So it's uh, sometimes you just have to ask people, and they they probably be willing to tell you if they're happy. Um, and uh, and looking online, and obviously you know my preference is that you're going to go to you know. Uh, hearingtracker.com <laughs> and and check out our directory. Uh, we are, we have been building it for a few years and it's it is starting to get better. We've identified uh, about 200 uh, providers who are uh, providing uh, best practices or who report providing best practices. Uh, so you know you may or may not have one in your area, but uh, I do uh, recommend having a look on there to see if we have anybody. And there's a couple of other tricks that you can do on our website to try to find somebody who's doing what they should be. Um, and I'll I'll go over that. I'll go over our website in just a minute. But um, uh, yeah, so the other thing you may want to look at for an audiologist is uh, what um, educational background they have. It's to me, you know, sometimes you've got uh, a doctor of uh, philosophy, you know, PhD, who may 
who may not be that personable. And so, you know, they're not always going to be better just because they have a better degree. But in general, I think it's it's great if you can, you know, see one of these people that has, you know, has has some background in audiology. A doctor of audiology is the newest degree, um, replaced the uh, Masters of Science in Audiology recently. Um, some might say that the Masters and the AUD are very very similar, um, and a lot of the master's degrees people have a lot more uh, experience in the clinic because they've been doing it longer. So, um, you know, I wouldn't necessarily go by that, but you know, if you do see that your audiologist has one of those degrees, I think that's that's a bonus. Um, all right, so just I have uh, kind of gone over uh, a lot of of this um, already uh, as far as uh, hearing aid features. Um, so I won't maybe take as much time here, but I've gone over the telecoil and the advantages there and why you probably want to consider that. Um, you know, uh, the volume control button, you know, does a hearing aid have one? Is it, can you actually have some type of control of the hearing aid or does it have no buttons? Because there are hearing aids with no buttons and you, know, you, you may not be able to control it at all or you have to have a, a, a remote or a smartphone compatibility. So that's something to think about. Um, uh, push button, that's so you can change the, um, the sound setting of the hearing aid. So go from like a noisy program to a music program to a quiet program. So the hearing aids today, that's less of an issue because you, you've got a lot of um, automation that's going on with the hearing aid switching environments for you. But some people do like to have the manual control of a push button. Um, so depending on what you're all about um, that that may be a good thing for you. Directional microphones are pretty much in most hearing aids, although there are some of the smaller ones that go into your ears that do not have my, uh, directional microphones. Um, if you do have a lot of trouble hearing in background noise, uh, I I would definitely consider getting a behind the ear product with a um, a good directional microphone system. Uh, synchronization and streaming, you know, streaming ties right in with the, you know, FM and smartphone compatibility um, where you can stream audio um, from other sources and especially if you like music or if you want to be able to listen to an audio book or a podcast or whatever, streaming is great. Um, or for TV um, and, and in some cases you may need a TV adapter which might cost you another you know, 500 bucks. I don't really know uh, how much those prices vary, but um, something something to think about uh, when you're choosing a hearing aid uh, if you have a lot of problems with TV. And that may be a case of having a, a dedicated solution for your TV, like a um, an, uh, infrared TV amplifier thing where you just put some headphones on when you're watching TV, or it might be a case of you know trying to get your hearing aid set up to work really well with your TV. So something to to discuss. Um, I really feel like I'm going to fast forward here a little bit because uh, I know that there's, I can see that there's uh, questions coming in. So let me just get to the end. I'm, I'm almost there. Uh, these were, just quickly, these are features that aren't kind of apples to apples ones. So, so these ones are, you know, it's either they're there or they're not um, in the hearing aid versus these ones where, you know, you have different gradations of, uh, or different kind of, uh, strength of these features. Um, so just as an example, you might have, um, you know, some hearing aids may have a lot more feedback suppression or better feedback suppression than others. So just reading that the hearing aid has feedback suppression doesn't really mean a lot. Um, and you even see, you know, hearing aids on eBay or, you know, these um, knockoff uh, brands that they have a lot of this stuff too, but guess what? It doesn't work as well as the stuff that you're going to get, um, you know, from the larger manufacturers. So it's just something to kind of be aware of. Um, and I, I promised we talk about hearing tracker. Uh, I didn't want to talk too much about it, but um, the things that I would like for you guys to be aware of is the service quality badge and the verified provider badge. Um, you know, basically, uh, you can find. We have, if you go to the very bottom of the website, there's a link there that says um, provider directory and that should kind of automatically go to your area, your home area. And, um, and then there's a little filter on the left that says um, service quality and another one that says verified provider. So you can actually click on those filters and it'll bring up the uh, providers in your area who have this. Uh, and to explain that a little bit, the verified provider badge uh, means that we, uh, like, Personally, I have actually verified that the provider 
is is doing um, the service, providing the services that they're supposed to be. Um, and sometimes that's because I know the provider and I've been to their clinic and I've seen what they're doing, or it's because they've sent me a, uh, a de-identified patient file where I've been able to look at the records and see that they're doing these tests and documenting them. Um, unfortunately, the verified provider badge is, is uh, there are very few people with that because it uh, requires some work for the audiologist uh, to get this one. Um, but I would love to have a lot more of these across the country. And if there are any audiologists listening, you know, please do uh, apply because it's no cost to you to do this. Um, and the service quality badge is basically we've got a survey on hearing tracker for the providers and they can go in there, complete the survey, and um, the survey basically is all about the, uh, uh, the best practice guideline. So there's a, uh, the American Academy of Audiology has a, um, a guideline for audiologists, which includes a lot of the services that I just talked about, the essential services, um, which, uh, you know, if they take the survey and it looks like they're doing everything they're supposed to do, we give them the service quality badge. And I would encourage you to patronize these people who have this badge because I do think that you probably will get a better result. However, um, you know, we do not obviously guarantee because they're not verified. We do not guarantee that they are going to provide the services that they say they will. So if you ever do find somebody who's not doing everything they should be, please let us know and we'll you know, take that badge away because it's the last thing we want to do is send people uh, somewhere where they're not going to get the, the promised services. Um, uh, going to just a couple other quick things, if you're a kind of a power user or, or you're looking for a specific evaluation, um, you can actually use these filters on the, uh, on, on the provider directory. We've also got some filters in the, the hearing center uh, directory, which is kind of another area which is more practice fo focused. Um, but you can select in there, for example, you can select real ear measurements, which is that test I mentioned to you earlier. Um, and there's a few other ones like uh, telecoil, uh, telecoil loop uh, demonstrations. Uh, so a couple of people have selected that as a service. Um, if you're looking to buy hearing aids unbundled, um, uh, so which it has been a big request people uh, have emailed me about. Uh, we have that as a service as well that you can check on the uh, on the filters, and that'll bring up providers in your area who are selling hearing aids unbundled. So just um, you know, have a look at all of that stuff that we have there. Some of it may not mean anything to you as far as all these evaluations, but um, you know, there's other things there that might be really relevant to you and might help you find somebody who's really uh, a perfect fit. So, um, and again, if you find anybody that isn't doing real air measurements or something and they're reporting that they do, then let me know. Um, Right. I think I've kind of covered that uh, more or less. If you go to any of the city pages on Hearing Tracker and uh, and look toward the bottom, you're going to probably see, you know, Phonak hearing aids in your city, or Resound hearing aids in your city, uh, Oticon hearing aids in your city, and you can actually click on those, and it'll bring up a map of all the providers in your area who have uh, who have those brands or who say that they have those brands. And you can also get there through the provider directory um, by actually clicking on the brands that are there on the left. You can find the providers that say that they fit those brands. Um, this is uh, just a snapshot of one of the hearing aid pages. You know, this is all the information that we try to give you guys. Um, you know, I personally went through and loaded all these hearing aids in. There's 600 or something. Um, and uh, as an audiologist, I didn't trust anybody else to do it. But you know, tells you about the battery size, uh, the technology level. Number one is the highest. Um, you know, number of programs, uh, the manually adjustable programs, number of channels, uh, how much frequency bandwidth there is, and then all these features are listed in orange. Um, and then it tells you if it's IP rated. You know, so this one's got moisture protection of seven, particle protection of five. That's great. So that's a really good hearing aid for somebody who's got any moisture issues or who's outside in the humidity or whatever. Um, and so I would encourage you guys to, to check out these, these features and stuff. And we're working on a, a comparison. Right now we don't have one, so you do have to kind of browse around. But uh, we're working on a way to compare the different models actually head to head. Um, yeah, so uh, same thing here, uh, just you know, talking about the different filters that you have for the hearing aids. So you know, for example, if you're looking for a made for iPhone hearing aid with a program button, 
uh, or a push button and directional microphones. You know, you can select as many of those features as you want, and it'll bring up a list of hearing aids that have all that. Um, and then you can read, read reviews, look at ratings, um, and there's a verified reviews button too. Which, if you click that, that'll just show you the reviews that are from uh, patients that have gone through from an audiologist's office. Um, so, as opposed to the ones that just come to the website and leave a review. Okay, that's it. We made it through all the slides. Um, I don't know, uh, Nancy, if I should just go through with these questions, or if you want um, to read some of them. I'll go ahead and um, pose those questions to you, if you don't mind. Um, there was a comment uh, at, from Beverly that she's been wearing uh, hearing aids for 38 years, but just had her first real ear measurement this year. That's kind of frightening, huh? <laughs> Yeah, I'm sorry, <laughs> Beverly. Um, I did post a, a link to the consumer checklist that we have on the HLA website in the um, diagnose, diagnosing section um, under hearing help. And we developed that with audiologists. So it's a good tool to use, and it does say on there um, to go to an audiologist that, that will perform the, the real ear measurement. So that's a great thing to, to take with you to an audiologist so that you get all your, your questions answered and you can make uh, some good choices about your um, hearing aids. Um, she also, Beverly also said that she understands that the new um, Phonak um, did, did not have a telecoil, but um, in the next round they will. I guess they re realized their mistake. Mm. Do you know anything about that? Um, I mean, that, that doesn't necessarily surprise me. I feel like I've heard that. Um, and oftentimes, um, they release a series of, of different models um, gradually. So sometimes mm -hmm. the, um, you know, they, they don't release the entire family. Uh, and I, I know in this case, I don't think they released a lot of different models for that uh, Phonak VR. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think it's just the one form factor. So you might uh, you might look forward to to that coming up. Um, uh, in the meantime, if you do need rechargeability with your telecoil enabled hearing aid, you could um, have a look with the Z Power thing and see if they have a retrofit available for for your model. Mm -hmm. um, and you may need to call them to find out. I I was looking for their compatibility list online the other day, and I. Somehow, I think it moved, so I'm not sure where that is. Um, so anyway, that's just another option um, if you if you really want rechargeability but need your telecoil as well. Okay. Um, Kurt said that he's brand new to this and will probably be getting his first hearing aids in a in a month or two, and it's all overwhelming. And <laughs> indeed, it is. <laughs> Yeah, well, um, tell him to email me if he has any questions. <laughs> um, I, I really feel like um, between Hearing Tracker and HearingLoss.org, those are two really good places for you to start, Kurt. Um, there's <laughs> just a lot of information on both sites. Yeah, go through the blog. I mean, I, I've written a lot uh, myself on the blog. Um, uh, and I, I think that you, you will find some, some valuable articles uh, to kind of help you get started there. Um, mm -hmm. Some of it probably won't be relevant, but uh, but you definitely will find some good stuff there. And, and there's definitely some good information on your on hearingloss.org too. So a ton of information. Oh, great. Well, Beverly's offered herself as a resource, so that's um, very <laughs> nice of you, Beverly. Very good. Um, Let's see, there was one other comment. Um, oh, is it possible to get a copy of your PowerPoint? If it's okay with you, Dr. Bailey will go ahead and post it along with the recording of tonight's presentation on the webinar uh, replay page. Oh, yeah, no problem. Okay, we'd be happy to do that. Um, I normally will uh, get this to our webmaster to post as soon as I possibly can. I know sometimes people like to rewatch it while it's still kind of fresh in their mind, um, or for people that that missed it. Um, so we'll go ahead and um, post that. And um, Dr. Bailey, did you want to just put your 
um, email address in that chat box, oh, and then okay. people can go ahead and uh, email you any questions that they may have. Um, See if I can. Okay. There we go. Um, this was a really uh, very informative um, webinar tonight, and I know that this conversation will continue as uh, the audiology industry and hearing healthcare industries evolve. Um, so I really appreciate uh, your time tonight, Dr. Bailey, and uh, thank you again, Heather uh, Easterly from Alternative Communication Services for providing CART tonight. If you liked this presentation and, um, and you want to learn more about HLAA, if you're new to us, Check out our website at hearingloss.org and please join us. Um, membership is just $35 a year and you get great benefits along with our upstanding magazine. So um, thank you everybody for joining us tonight and happy Thanksgiving and safe travels. Thanks again, Dr. Bailey. Thank you, Nancy, and thanks everybody for coming.